Hey everybody, this is Adam of the Almost Sideways Movie Podcast. This is the clip from the latest episode that just dropped. Make sure you guys like, share, and subscribe to this video and find us on any podcast form in the show notes down below. And this movie is one that really had my curiosity hurt and that was uh nobody uh starring bob odenkirk oh look at in, that graphic yeah isn't that a great graphic in wow. an action movie Shout like bob odenkirk shot. action movie that that doesn't really feel um like it should go but that that i think was what was great about the premise at least so let's talk about what we thought todd you're going first what's it about and what'd you think Okay, Nobody is directed by Elia Nyshuler, and it stars Bob Odenkirk as Hutch Mansell, which is a great name. And um, <laughs> it is. He's, a, he's a family man whose house uh, gets broken into, and he sort of wimps out on defending his home. But when he realizes they actually took some like personal items with like personal value that are sort of trivial, that he like goes out and seeks vengeance on the people that were involved, unwittingly beating like the shit out of like this Russian mobster's brother. And sort of sets off a series of events that uh, reveal his long dormant rage and uh, his like secret history. Uh, it's directed by the director of Hardcore Henry, which I've never seen, but I know Adam gave it zero stars. And it's written by the writer of the John Wick movies, as well as a producer of those movies. And it is a beast of a movie. Like from the the opening scene has this song playing that sounds like it's like straight out of Jackie Brown or something. And from like the opening shot, I was all in on this movie. It's essentially kind of true lies mixed with like a Charles Bronson type action movie thing, but with like the John Wick style choreography, the fights are nuts and they are so violent, but they're done so in a way that makes it more exciting than it really is like disturbing. And it has like one liners and like normal beats of an action revenge movie, but Odenkirk is the flawless cast and he's what makes it not so nihilistic. Like, he has that smirk on his face still. Like he'll he'll deliver one of those like Bruce Willis kind of lines, like "Don't call nine one one or something. But he'll have that look on his face. So it's like, well, I could have done that better. Or or he'll like cave in someone's face, and he'll 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 have that look that that says like, well, I'm getting too old for this. Like he's just unreal here. He's not like Liam Neeson or something or Van Dam. He he looks and feels normal, but he's actually kind of convincing as an action star approaching sixty. And his voice fits that type of badassery as much as it does like his normal like neurotic characters and Christopher Lloyd plays his dad when I thought he was kind of awesome in this like uh, even though it's completely ridiculous seeing him like wield a shotgun I mean it's entertaining to watch Connie Nielsen plays his wife Michael Ironside is uh, his father-in-law slash boss and he's pretty funny and the villain is Alexei Serebryakov who uh, I knew from Leviathan and uh, he's like just ridiculously over the top he sings karaoke and um, and then he like does some like crazy violent thing. It's it's kind of ridiculous. But when Riza shows up, I completely lost it. It all makes sense. It made sense at that point because like he is as much of an influence on Tarantino soundtracks as as uh, as Tarantino is. And so that that made sense that like the things that reminded me of Kill Bill and stuff, it was Riza that was the one driving that. And he he's done these kind of like um, pseudo gunfu things with like the man with the iron fists uh, that he directed, and he also directed one of the best movies of the last year. Uh, but uh, and and like the, the scenes with him are just, I mean, I, I it was just glorious to watch. It was like these slow motion action sequences, but at the same time, it had like this classical music blaring that reminded me of like when they go after Ron Perlman and Drive. It, it was it was just a beautiful way to end the movie and. The one, the one thing that I, I really appreciate about the movie is that they never actually tell you who the uh, who Hutch is or what he used to be. And, like the characters will just like, see one little thing and they'll they'll just like shudder in fear. But so it leaves it up to the imagination, which is always a better way to do it because I have no idea what he was actually doing for whoever, and I'm I'm kind of glad we never got that flashback scene. Uh, it's an action movie that's essentially like a cross between a history of violence and. Uh, he was a quiet man, which is an underrated like Christian Slater movie, but and it, and it's it's completely self aware and bonkers, and it would never apologize for that. And I love that this is the kind of movie Nicolas Cage thought he was making in the last decade. I'm giving it three and a half stars. <laughs> all right, all right, that was an on fire review right there. Well, Zach, what did you think of Nobody? 
Boy, I'm glad we went in this order. I hated this movie. <laughs> I thought. I, did you even? Did you fall asleep? No. Wow, <laughs> that's, that's new. I well, wish because he was in the movie theater. That's true. It was hard hard to do that. I I hated this movie. I I don't I I fully acknowledge that my reaction to it is maybe an irrational reaction. I feel kind of like when, you know, Ebert gave like one star to Charlie's Angels or to like, you know, a movie that he just lambasted. I I, I could not get into this movie from the opening moments. Even when they did that quick montage at the beginning of the movie, I was like, oh, this is all we're going to get? Like, the, the fact that we have Bob Odenkirk here, one of the great comic actors, and he is so underused in this movie. This is like such a bland performance that really any variety of actors could have played. This director, and I love that we don't, we're not going to say his name. We're just going to call him the director of uh, Hardcore Henry. I like that. That's, let's just refer to him as that. He has no sense of like characterization or character development. There's a reason we don't know this character's backstory because the director of Hardcore Henry doesn't really care. And so all we get is these action beats from one point to another. How are we supposed to believe that this guy has basically been sanitized for the last 30 years and then suddenly awakens and then does the crazy shit that he does in this movie? It is completely ridiculous, okay? And I get it. I get that, you know, for it, it's fun to watch it and it's escapist and what, whatever, but there's like no, there's there's so, no backstory. There's no emotional connection to the characters. He just abandons everything, you know, midway through the movie. And it's like, I get that. And and then and then we get the shootout at the end of the movie. And I have to, I just have to say a couple things about that. First of all, the movie turns into Home Alone at the end. Okay, what he's gonna booby trap his business and draw the like, give me a freaking break. Okay. Another thing I love about it is that he lures them to the the warehouse which apparently is only two blocks away from the karaoke place, right? And he's never even seen the karaoke guy before. He has no affiliation with the Russian mob. Uh, and then, of course, we get the money shot with Christopher Lloyd, which, you know what? I mean, that should have been worth the price of admission alone. But by that point, I was just tapped out of this movie completely. I was angry at I was watching. I hated the violence in this movie. I hated that they ruined even the, even the, the one scene that was like kinetic was the fight in the bus. And even that scene was just so ridiculous because by that point, this character has not fought anybody in 30 years. OK, give me a break. I just, I don't see it. This is a waste of time. Worst movie of the year so far. One star. One star. I think Zach's just mad that he had to spend 10 bucks to see this movie instead of 15. watching it at home. 15? 15. Instead of watching it at home on uh, on Netflix. I think that's really what's going on here. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> like, how many movies, how many movies have you watched in the last year where you're like, you know what? I got to watch it for free at home. Two and a half stars. Yep. <laughs> it, it could have helped. Uh, all right. Well, we always, we, we, we don't really plan this. This time we kind of tried to guess and we guessed right. I'm giving this three stars and I'm going to steal a phrase from Zach. This is why we go to the movies. Movies like this are why we go to the movies. To sit there and and be re uh, entertained by ridiculous, crazy action crap for an hour and a half. It was quick. It was fun. It didn't want to be anything more than that. And that's all you. That's all you got to take from it. I, I felt like I was watching. I, I was watching something that was supposed to originally have Liam Neeson in it, but then it went with Bob Odenkirk instead, which was I thought was a great turn because I thought he brought his just it being him instead of someone who you already re relate to as a badass just completely well, he's better changed at playing a loser That's what? Funny. he's better at playing a loser which is he's what he's playing loser. for the for the first 15 20 minutes of this movie uh you said you said the you didn't like how you you thought the the uh bus scene was was sloppy and and it didn't it was kind of crazy I mean, it was kind of supposed to be, and he got the crap beat out of him in that bus scene too, and that and it's because he hadn't been doing this for a while. Uh, no, I I thought it was it was just a lot of fun, and and it was it was everything I wanted it to be, 
And it wasn't anything beyond that. It wasn't spectacular. I wouldn't go like three and a half star masterpiece like Todd did. But uh, it's it's a fun movie. It's popcorn theater. It's exactly why we go. We it's when you go to the theater for a popcorn movie, this is what you want, and that's exactly what it was. I will say, um, I had no idea Michael Ironside was still a thing. I and in fact, I going into it, I saw his name and I said, and I said to myself, I thought Jester was dead, but apparently he's still around. Um, and uh, and it took me a second to even notice, uh, recognize him. And uh, Christopher Lloyd in this movie looks like Abe Vigoda did 30 years ago. Uh, that was another thing that I, I, I thought of. So, yeah, yeah. Like I thought like Abe Vigoda as uh, John Travolta's grandpa in Look Who's Talking is what Christopher Lloyd looked like. in this. Ooh, what, a, what a reference. I know. I know. It's weird, but that is exactly what I thought of as I'm seeing him on screen. So I was getting some Peter Boyle vibes, but maybe oh, we're in the same territory. I can see that too. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, three stars. Three stars. It was fun. It was fun. That's all I can say. Yeah, I, I love that he's not like uh, a perfect like fighter because he does. He gets stabbed. He get he breaks bones. <laughs> he gets like he gets the hell beat out of him a lot, and that's yeah. It doesn't seem to affect him. No, I mean it does. He obviously. Ha- I mean he has to get sewn up and shit. I don't know. I mean he it's a, uh, but uh, he's uh, it makes it more realistic. He's not just like a guy who's taking on ten guys and he's going to take them all out without getting scratched. Everything in this movie was just in the service of fight scenes. And I feel like because it's Bob Odenkirk, I I felt like this character could have been a lot more dynamic. For example, think of the relationship between the hero of this movie and the villain of this movie. Oh, you know, the villain of this movie is an over-the-top charismatic character, right? It is total happenstance that they ever even come across each other. Why not give this movie more of a backstory? Why not talk about how the Russian oligarchs have a vendetta against this guy and maybe their history goes back? It is a random chance encounter that all this stuff starts. That is such lazy, lame writing. And I get it. I get that this movie wants to have great action sequences and, you know, it, it, it's stylized and whatever. But, like, come on, less hardcore Henry, more... It's the writer of John Wick. The John Wick has the exact same thing. This is like a, another draft of a John Wick movie. It could be in the same universe, for all I know. Like, I mean, it, it's the same style of writing. And that those movies are super popular. And I, I think you even like them. <laughs> I have not seen any John Wick movies. Oh, well, you would probably like them. Yeah, Neither have the I, actually. I haven't seen any John Wick either. That we is may- a weird oversight by you guys. <laughs> yeah, we may need to take care of that at some point. But uh, but the first I, I time watch with Adam. He loves all those movies. There, there we go. I thought it was interesting though how um you, you're talking about just a random happenstance of the whole the whole uh, villain and everything. But it, I thought it was kind of interesting how they were playing up what he does in this as almost like an addiction, and and he because he he said several times I relapsed, and and often when you have a relapse like that, it you know stuff spirals out of control. And this was its way of showing that stuff was spiraling out of control. It's like you never know whose cousin you just kicked the crap out of. So, um. He's also got a seven deuce off to, offsuit tattoo, which is awesome. And that's what the one guy saw and no, and realized and then like what locked like 10 different locks on the door to get out of there. I mean, that's what I, I love that. We don't know what he was and why everyone or some. He was an auditor. But yeah. But yeah. <laughs> they, they see. They, they, they see something and they're just like, all right, I can't touch that guy. People that you wouldn't even think would even have that kind of knowledge, like some yeah. random Korean War veteran or whoever that guy was. Wouldn't that come up more regularly in his life, though? I mean, if that tattoo is a visible part of him and there's some recognition about it, like... He lives what? a very boring life chasing garbage trucks and working nine to five for a trashy company. I get that. I don't know. I just, I, I didn't believe the backstory. I think that's the problem. I, I think it was inconceivable that this person who was a train killer and one of the great, you know, I mean, he's such a badass that he, he you know, unloads the bullets and, is, you know, he doesn't want to go to the police, right? He's so, such a badass that he can just selectively turn it off for 30 years. I, at a, at a, just a basic level, I just have too hard of a time believing that. And I think it was just a wasted opportunity instead to bring in more of Bob Odenkirk's weird eccentric charm 
I feel like if we had gone to see this movie at Fox Tower 10 back in 2008, I would have liked it more. The world was a different place back then. This movie would have never played at Fox Tower. Not Fox Tower, maybe Lloyd Center. That, there Lloyd Center. Yeah, yeah. We would have gotten seen at Lloyd Center, yeah. Yeah. All right.